Hey guys, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So today's video is going to be the first in our Halloween series where we go over some of the most mysterious, spooky, and strangest cases that I could find. I read all of your guys' suggestions and you guys had so many amazing ideas and I'm just so excited to be bringing you guys a couple of extra videos this week in celebration of Halloween. Now, I will say that I wish that I could have you know, gone out and done the whole like spooky setting. I went to Hobby Lobby and tried to look for some decorations to give it kind of the feel, the Halloween feel, but I am so terrible with interior design. I don't know how to decorate. I couldn't find anything that I liked for the background of this video. I am just lacking in those skills, so I promise next year it will be a lot more Halloween-y, but yeah, I just... I am pretty terrible with decorations and everything like that, so I apologize for that. Also, before we get into the video, I just wanted to give a special shout out to my very first Patreons, Alex, Stephanie, Tracy, Crystal, and Hannah. Thank you guys so much for joining the Patreon family. I truly appreciate you guys so much more than you will ever know. I tried to reach out to each one of you personally to make sure that I told you how much I appreciate you and I honestly really do. I cannot express enough how much this means to me. So I know, again, I just say it over and over and over again, but I really do mean it and I really do appreciate you guys. You guys are a huge help to this channel and I would not be able to do this without you guys, so thank you. So now let's get into the video. So, cases of people who go missing in national parks have always intrigued me. I have always wanted to read the Missing 411 books, but they're kind of expensive, so I haven't been able to, but I do plan on going ahead and reading them soon. But either way, these types of disappearances are just so extraordinarily bizarre and no one really has any answers. Some people believe that something paranormal is going on. Others believe that it has something to do with something extraterrestrial. Others think that it's something a lot more explainable, like other humans being responsible or them succumbing to the elements. We don't really know, but what we can all agree on is these disappearances are incredibly scary, sad, and mysterious. So with that being said, today we are going to be discussing one of the many cases that involves someone going missing from a national park. Today, we are going to be talking about the unsolved disappearance of Carl Landers. Carl Landers was born on August 26th, 1929, and he lived in Orinda, California. I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Now, at the time of his disappearance, he was 69 years old, but his friends described him as being in extremely good shape. He was a distance runner, an avid climber and hiker, and for 30 years, he would run every morning. He even ran in the Boston Marathon and finished in a time of 5 hours and 30 minutes. In May of 1998, Carl decided to climb Mount Shasta. He had this ambition and a goal to climb all of the highest peaks in every county of California and this is exactly what he wanted to do on Mount Shasta. However, he went out for it the first time and he didn't actually end up making it to the top, but he made it his mission to return to the peak and get to the very top. Now, Mount Shasta is not an easy hike. It's actually an inactive volcano and if it were to erupt, the effects would be absolutely devastating. And technically, it could still erupt at some point. It's the fifth highest peak in California, standing at over 14,000 feet high and can be seen from over 100 miles away on a clear day. This is also a very sacred mountain and some see it as this giant energetic being and some see it as a place of worship like a giant temple or a big spiritual experience. The Northwestern California Native Americans view the mountain and the surrounding area as holy ground. It used to be said that no ordinary man or woman could climb the mountain because its energy was just too powerful. It was always said that it could be inhabited by potentially dangerous spirits and guardians who would harm an ordinary human who tried to climb the mountain unprepared. There is so much history to this mountain, but the biggest takeaway here is that it is this massive mountain that so many believe to be sacred and to have this special 
powerful energy. Now, obviously, most of the mystery surrounding this mountain comes from the history of the mountain. It used to be so that normal people weren't even allowed to climb the mountain but clearly it is available now for basically anyone to hike. So after his first try in May of 1999, Carl and his two friends, Barry and Milt, returned to Mount Shasta to give it another go. So here is the route that they had planned out. So they started at Bunny Flat Trailhead at about 6,860 feet elevation and was only about six miles away from the summit of the mountain. Then they would go to Lake Helen at about 10,443 feet and 3.5 miles away from the summit. The night before the men started out on their hike, they stayed together in a nearby hotel. The next morning, they left at about 4 a.m. to head out for their climb. They had ice axes, crampons, layered clothing, backpacks, food, and water. Like I said, they were starting out at Bunny Flat Trailhead, which was pretty much covered in snowdrifts at the time that they went. From there, they hiked about four miles to a place called Horse Camp, where they would spend the night. The next day, they hiked to a campsite called 5050 Plateau below Lake Helen. This is where they were all planning on staying before they would finish their final push to the top of the mountain. Now, as they were doing this hike, Carl was actually taking a medication called Diamox, which actually helps with the symptoms of altitude sickness. He had also been dealing with diarrhea and kept having to go in and out of his tent to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night in the middle of the freezing cold temperatures and the snow. That morning, May 25th, 1999, Carl said that he still wasn't really feeling good, so he decided to leave the campsite without his friends and start heading towards Lake Helen. The lake wasn't too far from their campsite, and he was wearing two or three layers of clothes, including a rusty red colored coat, ski pants, and of course his boots and crampons. So he was ready to go despite not feeling too well, and he was determined to go out and get going. Now, in a couple sources that I saw, he said the reason that he went out early is because he was cold and that he wanted to get to Lake Helena, but I imagine that the closer to a lake, the colder it would be. So it didn't really make sense to me, and I also don't really understand why him not feeling well would make him want to get a head start unless maybe he just didn't think that he could keep up so he wanted to get ahead. I don't really know but that's just how the story goes and I'm not really sure why he decided to get a head start but that's just apparently what happened. But either way, after about 30 minutes after Carl left, his friends decided to start heading towards Lake Helena. However, Barry actually went back to the tent because he wasn't feeling too well either, so he didn't want to go to the lake. So the other friend, Milt, went to Lake Helen on his own. When he got there, he asked the mountain ranger if the mountain ranger had seen anyone going towards that way. The mountain ranger did say that he saw one person that morning, so Milt tried to catch up, but quickly realized that this person was going so fast that there's no way that it was Carl. So he actually turned back around and asked the ranger once again if he saw anyone else, and the ranger actually said no. So at this point, he just went back to the campsite hoping that Carl was there. By 5 p.m., he got back to the campsite and saw Barry, but Carl was nowhere to be found. Of course, this was incredibly concerning, so by 8 p.m. that evening, Milt went back to the Bunny Flat Trailhead to alert the Siskiyou County Sheriff's Office that Carl was missing, and again, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. That next morning, the authorities were on the search. They searched using grid patterns. They used a helicopter with infrared sensing devices, searched on foot with the US forest rangers and volunteers, took out professional hikers to the summit. They used sniffer dogs and searched every possible inch on this mountain. But despite their exhaustive and intensive searches, they found absolutely no sign of Carl anywhere. They didn't find him, his backpack, his clothing, or any of his personal belongings anywhere. There was absolutely no trace of him 
anywhere. There wasn't even footprints in the snow where he was supposed to have been hiking and no other evidence that he had even ever been on this mountain. The search was led by a man named Grizz Adams, and he actually did an interview with a man named David Paul Leeds, who is actually the author of the Missing 411 books. In the interview, Grizz Adams said to David, in 35 years, I've never had this happen to me. We were all over that mountain. He was not on that mountain. We brought canines in, they didn't pick him up. We flew around it, we dropped guys at the summit. They came down all sides. They couldn't find him. They talked to people who were on the mountain. They didn't see him. There's snow around the path where he was and nobody went outside the path. When David asked Grizz Adams what he thought happened to Carl on that mountain, he said, that's the million dollar question. He either went up or in but he's not on it. They had exhausted their search efforts and did everything that they could do to find Carl, but to this day, no one has found any trace of Carl Landers on that mountain. It is believed that Carl Landers had gone missing somewhere between that campsite and Lake Helen, since there were no tracks of him going anywhere off the trail. Now, I do wanna mention that there aren't really many places that he could have ended up if say he just fell or something like that. There weren't any crevices or craters to fall into, and there wasn't really a dense forest or shrubbery for him to be lost in. There was nothing like that. I'm not exactly sure 100% of the exact topography of the area, but it seems like there really wasn't anywhere for him to go where he would just never be found, especially since there were no tracks going anywhere off the trail. So of course, there are a few theories in this case. So the first theory is one of the more realistic theories. So we know that Carl wasn't feeling well. He was taking meds for altitude sickness and he had diarrhea. Some of the side effects of Diamox include nausea, vomiting, drowsiness, diarrhea, confusion, and increased urination. So with the combination of him not feeling well, having diarrhea, possibly have even been vomiting or urinating more often, it's very possible that he became extremely dehydrated. Also, when you're at a higher altitude, obviously the air is a lot thinner, there's a lot less oxygen, which can cause a whole bunch of other issues. Low blood oxygen levels can contribute to the feeling of lightheadedness, dizziness, nausea, and confusion. With all of these different issues and with his age at 69 years old, he could have been so dehydrated and had such severe hypoxia that when he was hiking towards the lake, he was very confused and got lost. He may have been disoriented and didn't really know where to go. So even though it didn't look like he went off trail, he could have gone the complete wrong way. He could have not even been on the trail that he was supposed to be on in the first place. That could explain why the ranger never saw him and why they didn't find his foot tracks if he didn't even take the route that he should have taken. It's possible that he was so severely ill, suffering from all of these different symptoms, that he got lost and succumbed rather quickly being at elevation and being at that temperature. It's possible that amidst all of this, he could have fallen somewhere and was just never found. However, I saw in one source that the route they actually decided to take was relatively easy given the context. Obviously, climbing a mountain is not easy, but if you are an avid mountain climber, apparently that trail was one of the easier ones. It was said that this was the safest route and it was pretty much just like taking a walk on the snow rather than actually climbing and trudging up a mountain. We also know that he was extremely fit and well conditioned to do this type of hike even if he was almost 70 years old. We also know that he was with his friends so if he really was in that bad of a condition his friends would have probably noticed. Unless he's just like really good at hiding that type of thing. I just feel like if he was that sick and that disoriented, his friends would know how sick he was. And again, even with the high altitude and the temperature, he was an experienced hiker. This was not something new to him. So he would know 
how to prepare and what to do at that altitude and that temperature. Also, this hike is not terribly unpopular, so it seems unlikely that even if he did get lost, that no one would find him from the time that he left the tent to the time that he started wandering to when he either fell or got hypothermia or succumbed to the element some other way. Either way, I think that it could be a possible theory and it is possible that despite their search efforts, he could have just ended up somewhere that was very well hidden and secluded. Most people do believe that his remains are somewhere out in the wilderness on that mountain. The next theory, which is one that I don't necessarily think is super likely, is that foul play was involved by a stranger or maybe that he was attacked by some sort of animal. The only really thing that is pointing to this theory to me is that he just left and was never found again, even though he had no intention of going anywhere. However, I just feel like if fall play was involved, it would be very difficult to get Carl in a position for him to be able to be taken without a lot of noise or drawing a lot of attention. Then someone would have to bring him somewhere to be able to do whatever to him and then have to dispose of him without anyone saying, without leaving any sort of trace behind, no evidence, none of his personal belongings or anything, no tracks, nothing, without anyone seeing it. And like I said, this was a relatively popular trail. As for being an animal, we all know that it would be very messy and there would definitely be some sort of trace left behind if he was taken by an animal. Also, I don't really know if there are a lot of wild animals that interact with humans or if there are dangerous animals on the mountain. I am not exactly sure what kind of animals in general are on there, but either way, Neither of these theories seems very likely to me. The next theory, which is a very interesting theory, is that his friends may have had something to do with it. It could be possible that his friends went with him on the trip and ended up harming him, or maybe even went on this trip with the purpose of harming him. Either way, in this theory, the friends could have just lied about the entire situation to make it look like he was just sick and trying to recover from something and then went off on his own to hike, when in reality, it was all just a cover for something that they did. It is a very convenient story to say that, you know, if they did do something to him that, you know, oh, he was just an older man who was sick and maybe had hypoxia or maybe had hypothermia. I do think that if they did something to him that it was probably in their tent. Maybe they hit his body really, really well and that no one saw anything or found him. It is possible that it could have all taken place that night and when they said that he was up all night with diarrhea, that they were just going out and doing their thing and they just didn't want anyone to question it. Maybe that's why they asked the mountain ranger where he was and if they saw anyone to make an alibi for themselves and make it look like they were really looking for him. Then when they knew they were in the clear and they knew he was well hidden, then they went and reported him missing. I do think this is a plausible theory, but I just don't know how they could have accomplished it. It would have been pretty difficult for two older men to carry an entire body and not be seen or heard by a single person, hide him that well that no one found anything, and his personal belongings and get rid of any trace that he had ever been there even if it were in the middle of the night. As a side note in this theory, I saw some people say that it is possible that they did something to him before this trip even happened, and then they went on this trip to make an alibi for themselves and to mislead the investigation. That would be an extremely deceivious and smart move on their end, but I just don't know if that is very realistic. Just because like, why would they choose to hike for like two days before saying anything? Why wouldn't they just hike up a little bit and then maybe the first night say that he went missing. Also, I haven't seen anything online if any other witnesses had seen him, but I would imagine that at least someone else would have seen him. But if no one else had, this could support this theory. Also, I don't know how close Carl was to his family, but I feel like if he didn't actually go on this trip and this entire story came out about him going on this trip and then disappearing and that his family probably would have come out and said like, hey, he didn't even go on this trip. He went missing before the trip. We haven't seen him since so-and-so and there's no way that he could have been on the trip because he was missing before that. But I guess if no one saw him on the trip and he's not really close with his family, I guess I could see how this theory could be possible. So I guess this is a plausible theory if all of the right things line up. 
but I'm just not really sure how likely it is and I don't personally think that it's a huge possibility. So now let's get into more of the mystical theories. So I think that it's pretty interesting that this mountain just so happens to have this history of being mysterious and maybe even haunted by spirits. There was a time where people weren't even allowed to hike this mountain because of how scared people were of being taken by evil spirits. Some people believe that that's exactly what happened to Carl. Whether you believe in that type of thing or not, it is something to ponder on. Another theory, of course, includes alien abductions. For this particular case, I don't know if I think this is possible just because of the volume of people that would have been on the mountain at the time and that this was broad daylight when he went missing and that there were a ton of other people in the area. So I just feel like with this theory, if this is what happened and that someone would have seen something, but I guess we don't know. I don't know how plausible I think the whole alien theory is in this particular case, but in general with a lot of these national park and wilderness cases where someone just seems to be plucked off the earth, a lot of people think that that is actually precisely what happened. They were plucked off the earth by aliens. Again, in this particular case, I don't know how likely I think it is, but I do think it is possible in a lot of cases that are similar to this one. So the skeptic and realist in me wants to say that I think the first theory seems the most likely. But like I said earlier, it is always interesting to take a look into other things and consider other possibilities. Whether it be the paranormal or extraterrestrial or whatever, I think we can't just look at these very realistic and earthly possibilities. We need to think outside the box and think there could really be something else responsible for people going missing without them leaving any trace behind. In my opinion, anything is possible. I do tend to lean more towards what we know and what we can see, but who knows? I'm always open to open my mind to all of the different possibilities and I think that it's very foolish not to. But either way, he is currently listed as missing and or endangered. Carl Landers has been missing since May 22nd, 1999 and would be 90 years old by now. He was five foot nine inches, 150 pounds, white male with blue eyes and brown or gray hair. If you know absolutely anything about Carl's mysterious disappearance, please contact the Siskiyou County Sheriff's Department at 530-841-2900. So that is all I have for today's video. I'm really curious to know what you guys think. Do you think that he got extremely ill, possibly wandered off and succumbed to the elements? Do you think foul play involved or do you think it could be possibly something paranormal or extraterrestrial? please let me know in the comments below. If you did like this video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for the next video in our Halloween series on this channel. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked below. Also, if you wish to help support this channel, my Patreon is linked below. I appreciate any sort of support that I receive. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please do not hesitate to send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. Every single case that I cover are suggestions from you guys, and I read every single case suggestion that I get, so please do not hesitate to send those over. With that, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and I hope you're enjoying our little Halloween series so far, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!